Welcome. Get comfortable in this lovely venue. Um, it is the kitchen. I was quickly informed by Ben Silby, the managing director. It wasn't the station kitchen, this is just the kitchen. Um, and I suppose I just want to first welcome you to another Good People, Good Business. Um, but first I want to tell you a bit about the venue and thank these guys for hosting us because every time, as you can see from the um, slight faff we've had with technology and borrowing um, or being loaned a projector from this venue and everything, there's always a few sort of TV problems. It just gives you more time to spend more money on the social enterprise and enjoy each other's company. But um, the station kitchen's um, a great place, and, or the kitchen, should I say. Um, even though we are in the Creative Youth Network building, they're just the landlord for this space, this is an independently operated social enterprise um, owned by the, the Bristol YMCA. Um, they not only provide us amazing food, a great space right in the middle of the city, producing great hosting events, they've even done weddings here, um, but they do apprenticeships, <laughs> training, they work with adults who just need a break, who um, want a shot at a new opportunity and a chance to learn something. So um, we're just really grateful to always have venues that are in keeping with the theme of this event. And so thanks everyone for being here, thanks for your patience. Um, this event, um, one of the reasons is a little bit later, we're waiting for our sponsor, which is Dirk from School for Social Entrepreneurs. But we're very pleased that we're doing a new, um, a new model or a new approach of delivering these events, because we generally just find a way of getting a paid bar, or we volunteer just to come together and do the event because we really enjoy it and it's valuable. But we figured actually it's good if an organisation puts down a little bit of money to help us do that and all the wheels. Even though it doesn't cover anything towards our time, it will help some of the um, free drinks which will lubricate your networking in the break and afterwards. Um, and also just working in partnership is good. So our first sponsor is School for Social Entrepreneurs Bristol or Southwest. Um, who are involved in a range of the programmes and you'll hear a little bit more from Dirk later on um, when he comes from a meeting which we all had to leave about um, 30, 40 minutes ago. Um, but good people, good business. The reason why we do this is because we're really passionate about bringing people together. Um, we're all really busy just doing our thing, whether that be working in management business, maybe that's running our own business, whether that's starting something up and actually spend a lot of time just head down wondering what's going on in the rest of the world. And so if we create an event which just creates a space, we can come together, we can chat to each other, we can learn a bit about what we're doing, we'll spark off a few different ideas and maybe a few good connections made that can maybe be good for what we do in Bristol and, and just it helps us as much as um, I hope you, know, you guys take something away from it as well. Um, we do one Every two or three months, we keep it quite vague. This is run pro bono by a wonderful group of uh, our volunteer boards uh, who we'll meet later on. So, um, bro, we've got three speakers tonight. Um, we've got the first Mark Jackson in a moment, who I will put, and we also have Julia Clark, who's with us now, and then my uh, a friend of mine and a really interesting uh, entrepreneur, Barry Faramond, who wants to open up music. Um, you'll be hearing a little bit more from him later on today. But we also have our usual thing at the end of the event, which will be at about 7 or about more like 20 past probably now, um, which will be our two-minute pitches. So we've got five people who have already stepped up just to share something um, about their work. It's not a pitch. We have no money. It is not formal. It's not scary. But it's a great informal way of just sharing with a wider audience a little bit about what you do um, in your business. So we've got a few of those people already here, but if you want to speak to me or one of the guys in wait briefly, um, speak to any of those, then um, to do a two minute pitch at the end, and we've probably got space for a couple more, um, so just let us know. And we'll have a bit, of drink, a bit of a break in the middle, have a bit of a drink, and we should finish probably eight quarter past. Um, I think now with some of the delays we've had. So um, the other thing to say is this is not your usual business networking event, so feel free to have fun, feel free to clap, to cheer, and um, to be enthusiastic. The, uh, what we ask the, um, the speakers to do is actually use an, an, main, an informal um, and quite fun way of presenting ideas, which was set up to make sure that architects didn't talk so much about their concepts or their designs. That's how it's originated. So it's 20 seconds per slide. Um, and it's only images, and the slides, are the slides are timed, so it ends up at about 6 minutes 40. And so this means that people can present not just their business and their business head and the thing which we all sort of show face at when we go to business meetings, but actually talk a bit about why they do what they do and how they got there and what they came to get there and a bit about that kind of story which you don't often hear about. Enough. So um, all of our speakers are kind of stepping up and doing something they haven't done before and um, putting themselves out there a bit, so I'd, I'd really be grateful if you really appreciate it. So, um, with no further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, which is Jackson of Ecomotive. <laughs> is it all right if I give you this, this amazing microphone thing? This is the first time we've done this. We have Carl on our various technology things, everyone, and um, this is a way of making sure we can share this with everyone. So if you stick that there, is that all right, Carl? I'll do the as long as it's closer to his face. 
da einer? Ja, gerne. Ein Album aus Setup. Your first presentation. This is your first execution, I guess. Yeah, I don't quite know what it means. The slides just keep ticking over. Indeed. Right? Indeed. Yeah. And um, they're not standing in front of them. Yeah. Okay, and I'll sort of count you in. But um, before we do that, I'll just ask a question. You're Jackson Molding, right? You're in some more boats? You're in some schools? Ecomotive. Excellent. And you've been working with Ecomotive How long? We set up Ecomotive, I guess about four or five years ago, but it's, it's, we've had other things that we've been running at the same time, so it's all been a little bit dormant, and then it's kind of come into play, and then it's kind of gone dormant again, and I'll just kind of touch on some of the other things that we, we're doing that have kind of evolved out of Ecomotive a bit as well. And we'll have a bit of time for questions and a bit of time. So, okay. Um, I'll come here, and you, you have to go? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right, here we go. Right. Time, is there some time then? Okay, right, so. Ecomotive, um, there are some big major issues in the, in the world that we're all having to face and um, climate change is one of the biggest things that probably are going to be threatening our survival, uh, the world's survival and we need to um, find a way that we can work together either as individuals, or communities and as people. Um, peak resource is another one, so peak oil uh, all the other metals, all the other things, the resources that we're going to have to cope with. So these big things, climate change, peak resource, and the third thing is the economy. So these three big issues, sometimes they're almost too big for us to even work out how we can deal with them. We've got so many things in our own lives we're trying to cope with, from um, just trying to live, trying to get food on the plate. Um, and many years ago I worked in Tbilisi, where we were trying to look at air quality and waste management with people. But they were just trying to, trying to get by in the day. They couldn't be thinking about these other bigger issues. This is Maslow's hierarchy of need. If you don't know what it is, have a quick look. But it shows that we've got a series of things that we need to deal with before we can get to self-actualization. So uh, physiological need, um, the next one up was actually shelter and the space, our, our ability to support and cover ourselves. So. Um, Housing is a really key area. Shelter, roof over our head. It's really hard for us to deal with some of these the bigger climatic issues, economic issues, if we don't have a roof over our head. So <clears throat> we've got a balance between normal delivery of housing, which is generally profit orientated, huge amount of money made, um, average house prices in Bristol go into the roof, there's 50,000 homes in Bristol needed, balanced against people. What do we need? We've got a huge number of people on the affordable housing waiting list. Sustainability is being knocked out of the water. And we're losing our sense of community. We lose, people are getting lost in this massive delivery of growing society. And we need to find a way, not just us, but people, that there's a growing need for people wanting to find connection. They're wanting to find a way of being part of part of something stronger than just an individual living in an individual house on a street with no connection. So this is where the background for what I do came from. I was involved in a community-led housing project in St. Werburgh's where we took on a two-acre site and we delivered 40 homes through community-led housing. Self-build, custom-build, um, we built the shells for the central plots and people came in and, and did all the internal work. So we created plots all the way around. We did it in a different way. It wasn't profit orientated. Nothing wrong with profit, but if that's the main objective, then we lose some of the other aspects. So just as a quick example, one of the houses on the site, um, bearing in mind this is a number of years ago, but build costs are much less. We've got... Um, an element of sweat equity where you're putting the effort in. You can also choose the design of a house depending on the budget that you've got. So we're about, through Ecomotive, how do we enable people-led housing? And from this, um, so these are two homes, both timber frame, different types of finishes on them. One's timber, one's got a cement <coughs> blend on it. Solar panels, this was like 14 years ago. So solar panels, you know, we had the biggest PV system in, the, in Bristol. The benefit of people-led housing has an impact on our well-being. 
We use the same question set that we anal the <coughs> council analyzes well-being across the city, and we looked at the specific interests, the, the, the results for the site. So the green is the site where we did the self-build. Very dramatic changes. It's an open site, it's not restricted. So Asheville Action Group, I'm one of the directors of that, and we set up that housing project. From that, we set up Ecomotive. From Ecomotive, we set up Community Build, the self, local self-build register, and Snug Homes, which we're going to touch on. We also assisted the City Council in setting up Bristol Community Land Trust, and we set up the National Customer Self-Build Association, doing lots of government and policy work. Here's a collection of houses in Amsterdam. Amsterdam owns 70% of the land. They are actively, as a local council, providing self-built plots. You can go on the council website, you can find plots, you can take a plot and you can build your own home. It's easy. There's another project. This is, uh, again, in Holland. This is a place called Almira. 3,000 self-builds on one site. It's really putting people back in the picture. It's not top-down like we have in the UK. So we really want to find a way of bringing the end user back into play. This year we've set up this project called Snug Homes and, it's, and we've been starting to explore what people want. And we've been getting lots of people to fill in a little white board saying what their issue is, what their dream is, what, their, what, they, want to, what, what they want out of a home. And that's been really inspiring because there's so many people go, I just want to be able to have a home. I just want to have something that is my security, my safety. But you've got the housing that's going for 235,000. You've got people that end up living in trucks and boats and um, some, you know, mostly out of desire, but also out of need because it's hard to afford these other things. So we thought, how can we play on this tiny house movement and try and um, work a way of creating a home that's small enough that people can afford so the cost is, the cost is less. We're also looking at bit, making homes playful, thinking about how we can make places that we live more creative. And we came up with uh, a, 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 a small conceptual design based on, that's not as, doesn't look as exciting as those other colourful ones, but it's conceptually around making it small so it's low cost and super ecological so all the materials coming from either local or renewable resources. Um, and that led into an evolution of, of the design through to, because of minimum space standards and policy standards, we've currently got a design that's two storeys. It's about 30 square meters, 32 square meters in total. And it's low impact and can be off grid if it needs to be. So um, if you want to know more about what we're doing, we've got a fantastic set of talks and workshops we're working up now for the first week in December. Um, we are looking at building the prototype on Redcliffe Way, uh, either starting in the next couple of months, um, and we're about to put a planning application in, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Should I do this off? Okay, I like it. There's three big issues. So, what, as you said, one is land. Um, the city council supposedly owns around 40% of the land in Bristol. Um, not all of it you could build on, but um, land is a big issue in how land is sold and passed on because it's generally sold for profit, best value, and that always pushes uh, what you can do on the site to a maximum. So, it's like, what, what's the maximum we can get? A big block of flats, cramp all in. You can then, each flat has the resale value and that allows someone to buy it at a much higher price than maybe a more conscientious design would lead to. So that's one of the sort of big problems. Um, and planning generally sort of will allow that sort of process to happen. 
just to be specific, you know, you can't either you can't get a shot at science, which you would want for a large cell phone to Well, there's or a, they're at such a price. It's so there's yeah, so the big sites are difficult for communities to get together to buy because they have to get themselves together enough that they've got enough financial asset to be able to buy a big site. Smaller sites the council's now not getting rid of because they are doing their council housing program, which is fantastic, which is really important. Um, there are small sites coming out of the council which are very difficult to deal with, and there are some that they're releasing. But it's that ability, it's, it's a joined up, so none of these, it's quite difficult to deal with any of these things without talking about the joined up between land, finance, and people's um, knowledge, or no, not knowledge, people's understanding that it's possible. So there are, there's been discussions about how we can create a, uh, a local fund for Bristol, local investment fund pot, um, to look at how we can maybe enable buying land to buffer the security of obtaining the land. So that the land and the price and the, the, the financial mechanisms come together there. But then we also need people to start standing up going, actually, you know what, this, this is what I want. We've been so indoctrined out of that understanding that needing your own housing project is something that you can do. You know, the, the project I showed of 40 homes on the site was a fantastically um, inspiring and empowering for the people involved in it and they weren't all they weren't all builders they were people that had never even picked up a hammer before so the people built their own home and people ended up with a home that cost significantly less than if they had bought a home I couldn't afford a terrace home on the on the road beside the site but I've now got a home that I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time be able to borrow the money from a bank um, and build my own place and Without, without all those things coming into play, with the community group supporting that process, the bank enabling me to have a mortgage, I had to find a £3,000 deposit to be part of the project, and that was my hardest thing to do, because I didn't have £3,000 to even put my, put my deposit in. But I managed to be able to build a home once I got to that and borrowed a bit of money from friends to like put that deposit, I could then get a bank, mortgage, and all that sort of stuff. So there is that mechanism, land, finance, and um, and our desire to actually be in the, in the driving seat of our future homes. Mm. Thank you. I've got any questions? Um, once you stand home on my step way, is that, is that what you're building there? Yeah, so we haven't started yet. We've, we have just <coughs> done the planning application, but we haven't submitted. We're about to submit it hopefully this week. So we're going to have a, a bit of a window while they consider it. If we get planning, um, then the council will give us a license to use the site for one or two years, um, oh, okay. which then we can build. So it's going to be like a, a little show home, and around it we're going to have an exhibition space around housing, around different projects around Europe that, um, that are inspiring. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a seed for people to go, actually, you know what, I want to go and have a look at this house. In our project, we get a lot of people walking around our site and they kind of look and go, wow, the house is really big, I, I wouldn't really know where to start. So if we can do a little place and go, look, you could probably have a go at building something like this. And they go, okay, that sounds good. Okay, so is this not like a kind of prefab? It is going to be pre, we're going to build it, um, we're going to build it elsewhere and then take it down in four, four modules. And each module can go on the back of a truck. So it'll, it's kind of playing part of the process of designing up a prefab unit that uses ecological materials and will be built to passive house standards but it will be customizable so it's, it'll be a custom build so people can have the shell and then do what they want with it we're not saying that's what everyone needs to do but it's it's trying to remove some of the barriers and as things flow and people go okay i built that that was wasn't too hard um now i'll I'll try doing something a bit more organic or a bit more, you know, a bit different if they want to further down the line. But it's getting that, getting that shift for people in, in our concept of people's minds that actually this is a possibility. Yeah, if you get planning for it, are you looking for volunteers to help you build it? Yeah. Sounds like you've got one signed up. Yeah. I know, well, yeah. I've got, there's a load of, there's no little leaflets here, so.
take one of these and you can, it's got details on the back and also you can, you can cut it out and make your own little uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, And it's got a beehive that goes on top and a solar panel. <laughs> So you can come away from this event and get your own Yeah, but the workshops in um in December, come see if you can come there about three hours each day. Um, Martin at the back, my colleague, put your hand up, Martin. So um, Martin will be around to talk to as well. So um, have a chat with Martin about what we're doing, and we it's going to be a fantastic week. And at the end of the week, we're going to have a bit of a party as well. So it's going to be good. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Because no one's going to come and talk to me here, but definitely you Okay. Um, one, yeah. uh, just a uh, quick um, apology. I, I do have to leave about six, five past six. So if you if you want to chat, it's all on that. Thank you, thank you. Twenty-second thing because I'm too scared. But I, what I suggest is, when you get bored with what I'm saying, just move on to the next slide. I won't see them because every speaker gets like a big hand. Oh, okay. And Julia Clark, CEO of Community Health. Welcome to the stage. Okay. I'll fit the slides for you. Am I going to be in the way? No, as long as you keep your head down, it's fine. Okay, so um, I don't know if you're going to find this interesting at all, um, but it's a, a sort of a story of my journey to uh, where I am. This is a picture of me being a chief executive. Um, I, th I thought that's what they're supposed to look like, so um, that's how I presented myself. Um, I'm chief executive of Bristol Community Health, which is um, a, I think it's the number 15 in the staff-owned organisations nationally. It's um, an NHS spin-out, if you've heard about those. It's a company limited by shares, a community interest company, and we have about 1,200 staff. And next March, we're likely to have another 500 join us. So we are large. Um, and we run adult community services. 500 staff will be children's community services if uh, that contract goes ahead. And we run healthcare in prisons. Uh, next. This is where um, I had lived for 35 years before I came to Bristol, um, where I had my education. Some of you might recognize it. It's a, a very large university with a small town attached. Uh, Bristol's a bit the other way around, although you've still got a large university, but you've got a much bigger town. Um, I then had uh, 20 years in railways. Um, this is a freight train. Um, and so Act 1 had sort of four or five scenes to it. I had a civil service job. I ran my own consultancy business. Um, and I launched a trade association come lobby group, which actually I turned into a social enterprise, but I didn't know that that's what it was at the time. Um, and it was focused on getting lorries off roads and freight onto rail. Um, and then I ended up back in government uh, working as the um, executive director for freight at something called the Strategic Rail Authority, which John Prescott created after privatisation to try and bring some strategic elements back. Um, this is how it ended, um, my career in the railway. That's a train hitting the buffers. Um, and the next slide, this is the man who sacked me. If anyone knows him or where he lives, let me know. Um, I believe he's now running a bicycle repair shop in Scotland. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but I love the headline on the Telegraph uh, when uh, I got my out-of-court settlement. I particularly like the humiliating public climb down. Um, but unfortunately, it did mean I was out of work for 18 months trying to rebuild a career. 
So I did a few things. I got a coaching qualification and I started on the journey to becoming a chartered director at the Institute of Directors. Um, and this is a special school for um, youngsters with behavioural difficulties. So um, I became chair of governors of that. And um, we had some stability problems with staff and I ended up recruiting seven head teachers in seven years. So that was the intermet. So then it was Act <coughs> 2, into health. This is the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, big white building, um, as, as they very often are. And there is a story about how I got that job because the chief executive was a bit of a rail buff. And so he'd been following my railway career in uh, magazines like Modern Railways and Rail Magazines where I wrote a column. And so he knew all about me. And when I applied for a non-executive position, um, he realised I knew something about strategy and I guess he was really curious to meet me. So I ended up doing um, a lot of strategic work over a period of a number of years for the Oxford Radcliffe. I also became chairman, this is what I thought a chairman ought to look like. Um, so I dressed like that and got the job as chairman of a Learning Disabilities Trust that was our annual report, um, and I did some other things in uh, health as well. So then, um, Act 3, um, in 2011, I <coughs> saw the advertisement for Chief Exec Designate of the Bristol Community Health Social Enterprise. I thought that sounded up my street. Um, so I applied for it, and I think I got it because actually it's a highly risky job, and um, it wasn't very well paid relative to other Chief Execs, so... Um, I was able to get it, um, and so I parachuted in, and this is what uh, the image that I chose to illustrate what Bristol Community Health looked like when we launched out in 2011, because it wasn't quite as bad as that, but what it's, that is a rudderless ship. If you Google rudderless ship, you get this image. Um, the business plan wasn't fit for purpose, the, the, the thing was an NHS thing, it had been neglected, underinvested, huge cultural baggage, um, etc. So we had to fix it as we went along. Um, what was good about it though was that the quality of care was good, the staff were very dedicated to patients um, and had a great ethos, so that was fantastic. That was kind of down in the engine room. Um, we had some difficulties right at the beginning. This is a boardroom fight. If you Google boardroom fight, this is the image you get. Um, at one point in May 2013, I was the only member of the original board left. We'd had huge turnover in executive directors. And on May the uh, 1st, I think it was, um, in 2013, at 11.08 precisely, all the non-executives and the chairman resigned en masse. Um, the uh, CIC regulator was not worried about it and we then sort of rebuilt the board. So after we got past that, uh, we produced a business plan that was fit for purpose. Um, you may recognise this actually as a balanced scorecard and one of those spider diagrams, but I made it a bit more colourful to try and communicate with staff that we needed to worry about our money and our productivity and our investment in ourselves as well as the patient care that was absolutely crucial to and dear to their hearts. We started to think about the community and what being a community interest company meant. Uh, we thought we might get a bus at some point. We still haven't got one, but um, hopefully we will get one. Uh, one of the key projects on there was a technology project. So these are some of my lovely, happy staff with their tablets, which meant they could put their data into the system in a patient's home and not have to come back and type it all into their system. They loved it. And uh, it also created a lot of productivity and improved the quality of patient care because data was up to date, timely and immediate. Um, this was the second business plan. The first one you saw was a thousand days because we had a thousand days on our contract. Unfortunately, we got a contract extension, so I couldn't do another thousand days. So we went to annual business plan and you see this one's much more streamlined because staff told us that we were doing too much change 
Uh, so we tried to bank our achievements and consolidate them and focus on just a few things. This is our fourth birthday that we've just had. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see some initiatives there which are um, sort of future developments. One called Healthy Villages, haven't got time to talk about, but it's uh, an important community-based um, uh, aspiration. And um, let's move on. So these are some of the things that um, illustrate our community purpose. Uh, we've got a patient and uh, public empowerment strategy, a lot of involvement uh, from our patients and families. We've got a community pledge called Benefit in Bristol, which you can see on our website. We have a newspaper. This is our advert on the buses of Bristol at the moment. Um, and we're very proud to have been shortlisted for two Social Enterprise UK awards this year, Social Enterprise of the Year and Health and Care Social Enterprise of the Year. And by the EOA as Employee Owned Business of the Year. Um, this was part of our application for those awards and our pitch really was we've come of, come of age as a social enterprise, we know what our purpose is, we're starting to deliver it and measure it and we've turned around relationships. So one of the things on that rotten old ship was that our relationships weren't very good either. Um, and we've turned those round, and we've now got a contract right through to 2019. Staff engagement is up. Uh, staff vote on key matters, including pay um, and things like that. And we've got partners, and we've invested a lot of those bits of money up there. That's the end of the Bristol Community Health story. Just to say, I'm still uh, working with the community. This is in Independent People, of which I'm a board member. I'm very proud to be so. And um, in amongst all of that, I've also had a life, and that's my grandson. <laughs> that's it. Any any questions from the floor? Your story is just really inspiring. But you go from strength to strength to strength. Has there been a failure that you learned from, which which has pushed you behind you? Because a lot of the time, it's only um, clearly being sacked was a failure. I mean, I put it all on that guy, the picture I put up, but I think that was a failure. I didn't, I didn't understand myself and the, the impact that I had on people. So um, this guy was a very different personality to me, and I thought if somebody didn't get it, the best thing was be more enthusiastic and wave your arms more. and. Uh, and he hated that, so I had to learn that people receive me in different ways um, and learn about that. So I, I e emailed him after that in very sort of measured tones and was much more successful, but not successful enough not to be fired. <laughs> but if you hadn't been fired, you never would have done that. I wouldn't have done that, no, exactly. But it was, it was a really, I have to say, it was a really hard time. I do. I quite often feel a bit fraudulent coming to a social enterprise event because it seems to me the true social enterprise starts from the ground up and is hugely creative um, and has its sense of purpose right from the beginning. And I think bringing out 1,200 staff who have a very public sector ethos and trying to develop that, the agility, the inspiration, the creativity um, and sense of purpose of a social enterprise has been quite hard, but I think we have got there now. Um, and I think having got there, we can model ourselves more, think more about what's needed for health and well-being in Bristol and how can we do it and less about we've got a contract with 124 key performance indicators that we have to deliver on. 
but, but, but it pulls you back all the time. Um, where are we going in the future? It's difficult because we, we're in a sector where uh, there is competition. We will have to compete for our own contracts. Hospitals don't have to do that, and yet they spend, you know, 80% of the budget. GPs don't have to do that, but community does, and we're tiny relative to the rest. And I think if you've got competition, it's going to be difficult for us all to regain our contracts every time. So unless there are more coming through, or unless that's changed, sadly, I think there might be fewer in the future. Do you feel that having an innovative approach to taking a broader view to describe away from just the performance metrics of the contract of thinking of what we know the community is working and what we know our staff, how can we deliver a really good health and well-being in the community? Do you think that's rewarded by the contracting system, the environment that pays your way? Do you think you can you know, play the game with both, make sure you get the contracts and yes. really uh, I mean, I think that's that's the way it ought to move. And I think there are some small indicators. So in the recent tender for children's services, um, what the first question that all the bidders had to answer was how they would embed themselves in the community and in the local health system. So that seemed at least the beginning of an indication that continuity and relationships are important. Um, and, you know, innovations around working with the voluntary and community sector and those sorts of things to enhance quality and stretch resources are beginning to sort of get some recognition. So, yes, hopeful, but, you know, if, if a private provider comes in with a very significant cost saving, it's quite hard for commissioners to not take it. But then we, we don't make a profit, so, well, that is to say we invest, reinvest our profit, so we work on tiny margins, um, and a private provider would be normally taking 15% out of the system. So we've got that to play with. So there's a competitive advantage of being a CIC? Yeah, I think so. <coughs> yes, I think so, increasingly. And the, the Social Value Act, you know, the... Uh, councillor consulting on how they're going to apply that in commissioning, so I think it will help. Hi. Just a question about the link to, to housing. Yes. Um, you know, health and housing, there, there's some sort of overlap, obviously. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on whether you're in key positions as a social enterprise to think about that. Yes, there's a hell of a lot to think about as a social enterprise. <laughs> Um, I haven't got my head around quite how to work with housing. Um, in the, the Healthy Villages sort of initiative that I talked about, which people call lots of different things, I've been trying to engage with all kinds of social enterprises, voluntary sector organisations around localities to say how can we work together to improve health and well-being. You know, is it about us referring or signposting or assessing in a different way? And is it about voluntary sectors that are providing complementary services? And we've made some progress. So we've got 40 volunteers now working directly with us, which we didn't have before. Um, but the specific housing link I have yet to crack. I sometimes wake up in the morning thinking, ah, that's it. And then I can't quite grasp it. So um, I'm very interested in talking to others who've got ideas about how we could do that. Excellent. So that's the start of the conversation. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time for being so open about a really fascinating yeah. uh, Big hand for you. And you're for the rest of the evening to address the yes. line and chat to people. Um, so, next up, we have uh, one person who is going to be doing a two-minute pitch, Chris. So, Chris, you have another line to sign from being a social entrepreneur, don't you? I do. So, the reason I'm doing a two-minute pitch now is because I'm going to this last station to another last station, and uh, as well as uh, we're in the business, I'm a retained firefighter in the community at home, and once a month we come up to Bristol and we train to at uh, Bristol Temple Station. So after I do this, I'll be over there and play my fun. Literally, I'm going to find it. I'm going to find this T-shirt on. Hey. It's red. It's Are you featuring in the calendar this year? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the calendar, uh, not really.
brilliant. So, you know, I think mean, you've done one two minute pitch with us before. Yeah, uh, and the reason I asked to come back and do another one is not because I'm a massive egotist, but I am. Uh, so, I run a business called Vantuit, and what we do is we sell the and we have fun doing water projects. And it's going to do two minutes. Uh, so, we've been around for about a year, and we've got wine from special suppliers, wine from Russian winemakers who want our wine. Staff and we started online and we donated to the Wars project. Uh, recently we switched over to working with uh, Frank, that whole story would take more than two minutes, but basically it completely makes sense because we're a Bristol based business and they're a Bristol based charity and what they really do is fantastic. Right now, literally as of last Friday, we are crowdfunding, so I'm literally here to ask for your help. Uh, we're at www.crowdfund.co.uk forward slash Mantilla. The video takes two minutes, 30 seconds, so it's even longer than I have here. But if you can go there, if you can like the video, if you can share the video, if you like the wine, you like the concept, if you can get involved, that would be brilliant. What we're going to do is we're going to import a palette of wine, the first palette of wine, that's going to be branded fancy We found an amazing uh, vineyard uh, in, in Bordeaux. We've got good sustainable credentials, they're passionate about winemaking. Um, and we're going to bring a red and white wine and we're going to change the business so we can wholesale those wines in bars and restaurants, predominantly in Bristol Bar. And that's what we can do is raise the funds for that first pilot one. So, uh, if you don't have a crowd from the UK, please check it out, share it on your Twitter, share it on your Facebook, your Instagram, all these things like Periscope, I've never heard of them, I'm pretty sure. And hopefully you can just start getting us together there and uh, get the project off the road. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me this is a ready for action to get on the ground to get this. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. And it's, it's, it's a really interesting business because it's actually quite challenging. You know, what you need to get to a certain scale to be doing that kind of distribution. So this is the start of that journey. So, fantastic. Okay, thanks so much. So um, we're going to talk now uh, just a little bit because we are at that challenging time in between uh, now and, and breaking uh, free booze. But part of this event really was to talk a bit about uh, the Bristol Bar Social Enterprise Network and the kind of new direction that we're taking with it, or actually what we're working towards, and just to share that with you, so to involve you in that conversation, but also start a conversation. Um, I'm trying not to use cliches, but actually that part is really important to us. So um, if, I, if you didn't listen to anything that I say or any of my um, colleagues say in the next sort of five, ten minutes, the main thing is just if there's something that you want to be working with us to do, to actually engage a wider audience in, um, to talk more about some of the activities that you have in a business and you want to put a focus on, or maybe some of the social issues that you work with, then come and speak to us in the break. Start a conversation with us because the Crystal Bar Social Enterprise you know, is a vehicle to be doing that. Um, I mean, for us, we really want. There we go. Oh, yeah. So, we really want um, social enterprise to be a viable part of the local economy and to mainstream really, not to be seen as that niche, not to be seen as um, something which is put to one side or considered as maybe not as high growth for the rest of the economy, but for our contribution to the economy and social issues to be recognised and for us to be working more to effectively together as a sector and with other sectors to actually build on those strengths. Um, we've formed a CIC, um, we have a group of people who this year or, or, uh, have been supporting us as volunteers and now some other people have come on board and some of our original partners with are forming a volunteer board. So we could all wait. And, um, and really what we want to do is just take the network from being in a simple form that we have now, which is doing three or four networking events every year, having a good website, being able to do some really good signposting, and actually build on that, find the resource that we need to do more, more involved work. But the main thing is that at the moment we just do this pro bono because we're really passionate about it and we're working in the sector. Um, how we take it forward will be dependent on us finding a resource, but most of all dependent on what your organisation is interested in using the network to do. It is a platform to promote yourselves, it is a platform to engage with wider audience, it's a platform for us to shout about the great work that goes on in Bristol. So um, we're kind of dependent on you to be part of taking that forward. And that's all I'm going to say. Well, we should introduce ourselves, actually, um, you may not know who we are. Um, oh, yeah, my name is Carlo Zero, I'm a director of a uh, development agency called Social Enterprise Works, which is supporting social enterprises to start and thrive uh, across the city. I'm Kyle, not Carl, I'm KYL. He's hairy, good looking one. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is that tall? <laughs> I run a social enterprise called Ecomedia Collective and we believe in helping create soundtracks of social change. So what we're doing here tonight is 
a live stream of tonight's event. Um, we do videos and we basically find out what you're doing and share it using online technology. Um, and I've been involved with what these folks do for a while. Uh, as Dan said, we do it because we love it. And there's no way. <laughs> I'm a third K person and um, I work part time for an organisation, uh, a partnership actually, a collaboration called E3M, which is about promoting social enterprises and living public services. Um, and in my other uh, part time, I'm a freelance social enterprise consultant. I've been working alongside Dan and Dan for the last couple of years, um, talking about the network and what we might be able to do to uh, integrate. The network started off with quite a bang, we were prompt, um, quite primed by the end. And find a couple of sources, um, but money very quickly dwindled, and so that's why for the last year or so, a small group of us and two others uh, aren't here, so I actually didn't mention them, but just a uh, small group of us have been working just in a voluntary capacity, almost like a little board of trustees meeting every now and then, putting on these events and thinking about how we might strengthen and grow the network here in Bristol. Um, so, our other two colleagues are not here tonight. Dirk Rover is on his way, he's from the School of Social Entrepreneurs in Darlington. Um, and then another guy called Nick Fidere, who works for the Real, Real Ideas Organisation. So he, he sends his apologies and Dirk will be shortly after the break to do uh, a short presentation because he's actually sponsoring tonight's event. That's how it works out. I was just going to add then, so we've um, we put our heads together over the summer, had a bit of a distraction in session. It's a voluntary led network which is very much uh, powered by its members. Uh, Can back aside? Sorry. Right. Okay, so, um, we kind of came up with four clusters of activity, um, which I appreciate are going to be quite difficult to see in the back of the room there, so, so we'll cover them. So giving the centre a voice, creating opportunities for connection, sharing and hosting, building recognition of the sector. We kind of did a bit of strategy and figured that these are the sort of four work streams that we thought were really important for the sector as a whole. Um, and in simplistic terms, appreciating the, the lack of resources and capacity we have to do that, uh, we thought that um, we've got a very vibrant website, which Carl's going to talk about a bit more about in a moment. But what we're thinking about um, there's a number of public consultations that are always looking for the voices of people like yourselves. Currently, there's something in Bristol, Bristol City Council is currently uh, putting out a draft social value policy, <coughs> uh, which is looking for comments and feedback from all of you. But currently, not many of you know that it exists out there. So what we want to try and start doing more of and better of is start aggregating both the opportunities for funding and support, but also the chance to have a say, share your views, and to get more involved. Uh, so we'll find simple light touch ways of doing that through the website. Sure. So the website, which many of you have seen, um, is a lot different to what it was when it launched uh, a couple of years ago. We've pegged right up. We really want to focus on doing two things. One, um, providing a gateway to you. So we're going to make it very easy for you to share your stories and for you to all effectively be guest bloggers on the website. Uh, we're going to invite all of you to make sure you go to the website, read what it says there, and take note of the email address they give you. By emailing your blog updates, your stories, your essentially whatever you're up to, that comes through to us. We moderate it and then we put that on our website. So it's essentially reflecting you. So please make sure you keep up to date with what we're doing via Twitter, via the website, and share what you're up to. Um, the second thing we try to make sure we do is find out what events you're holding, or what events you're paying attention to, so that we can put them on our calendar, which we share with everyone, and by just following the instructions on the website, those dates for social enterprise events in this part of the country will automatically appear on your calendars. You see instructions on how to do that on your website. But also, we like to find out what you're up to, so occasionally you might be able to drop over and make a video on it or live stream it. The thing is, you've all got stuff going on, and we like to do our best to put it all together in one place. And we also like to remind you that the LinkedIn page is now up and running. And that's a very good way to connect with us. And you'll find instructions on how to do that on the website. And I do have a slide with all the details. We do. We'll pull up in a second, but I don't want to move to that slide until no. until The thing is, it really is about you. So please dip in and share what you're up to. Because essentially we're trying to amplify the good stuff that you're all doing. And I've just, we've got some good talking points over the break. There's some uh, 
flats and paper on different tables with some of these headings. We're really interested in your thoughts. Obviously, there's different ways that you can engage with this network, different ways that you can contribute, different ways that you can be supported. We'd be interested in hearing your thoughts and seeing how you can all uh, play a role, really, in, in supporting each other to amplify the good stuff that we're all doing. So, if you've got any ideas at the break, which we'll come to shortly, I appreciate we've been talking at you for quite a while now. Um, well, please do put them down or come and talk to us at the break time. Um, and without further ado, our, our, our headline sponsors just walked into the room, so we'll invite them up. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're on a slot later, but whilst you're on the team lineup, then you, uh, you get two. I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm sorry I couldn't be any earlier. And it's great to see some familiar faces and some new ones. And I'm sure you've talked through a very simple but very distinctive offer that the network has developed. And as Carl was saying, nothing on that could happen without your support, really. So it's kind of your network, not ours. And I'll say a bit more about our work in Bristol later. But have a break and have some refreshments, a bit of networking. Okay, so. I'm very pleased to know I'm still up in the top scene. Uh, we have this, um, we have, I think, a really good foundation from some of the thinking we've been doing. I know, I think we've been quite lucky to have some quite clever minds help us out, looking at some of our strategy and where we want to work to. And it's actually quite an interesting challenge how you take a voluntary network to something which we think will have quite a role in the sector in this area. And um, the only way we can do that is actually having more two way conversations with you. So, if you want to speak to us in the break, thank you. All right, everyone happy? Great time. Great. Good morning. Good morning. First time with um, one of our networking experts to say, oh, I've got to wait 20 seconds for our live stream to find out again. Great. I hope you all had a good break and yeah, had some useful conversations. Um, it's really nice. I've probably met about four or five people who I've never seen at our networking events before, so for me that's a big thing. But does anyone else who doesn't know me and wants to chat to me, I'm always happy to have a conversation. And thanks again to Dirk for the wonderful refreshments. Good to go, Dan. Yeah. So, we're good to go. Okay, brilliant. So, um, just to quickly introduce the next speaker, Barry Farrimon. Um, Barry, how long have you known each other? Uh, we've known each other 12 years. 15? Is it 15? Yeah. Yeah, 15 years. Yeah. Uh, but in the time of Barry, uh, I've known Barry, he's always been really good at crossing management, and then he's managed to build this fascinating business around some of his attitudes and some of his passions and just it's I'll allow him to tell the story but now it's it's really flying there's been some great recent years as well. Yep. Which you're gonna tell us a little bit more about so, yeah. Yeah. should I just count you in? Good yeah, good to go, yeah. good to go, good to go. Three, two, one, fire away. Hello, hello everyone. It's me. Um, so my name is Barry. Um, according to my school report, um, I have good intentions but little self-control or perseverance. I'm often immature, thoughtless, and even disobedient at times, uh, which is a pity because I have quite a lot of latent ability, <laughs> which, um, well, part of that put me in very good stead for being the uh, managing director of Open Up Music because Open Up Music is all about realizing people's latent ability. Uh, we've got a very simple mission, which is to open up youth orchestras, musical instruments, and musical repertoire to young disabled musicians. So the thing that I wanted to talk about today um, was something that underpins the whole of Open Up Music's ethos, which is the social model of disability. So um, the social model of disability is something that states that people don't have disabilities. Society disables people, the way that society is structured. Um, a really good example of that would be, um, say if you're a wheelchair user, now, the social model states that you are not disabled until society disables you, until it insists that you need to use a flight of stairs or, or go down an escalator. And um, it puts the onus of responsibility on society. It doesn't infer that people need to change. It infers that society needs to change. We need to restructure society so that it doesn't disable people anymore. And that is, um, that's quite a creative spur, actually that we've got to restructure everything. It's, it's, um, it's a wonderful idea. It, 
it promotes um, creativity, but it also crea creates diversity. And as we all know, diversity is a prerequisite for evolution. So if we want to evolve as a society, then we need to diversify. Um, now, I'm going to break from the, uh, the tradition of, of having these visual slides with a little, little slice of audio, just 20 seconds of audio, um, which should play right now. Can I just ask, does anyone have 12 fingers? It's not as strange as it, as it sounds. Um, that piece of music is called Impromptu for 12 Fingers. And it was written by Michael Nyman for the film Gattaca. Does anyone know Gattaca? It's a great yes. film, 1996, it's a good flick. Um, yeah, and if you don't have 12 fingers, you can't play that piece of music. Now, a does anyone have, no? Okay, that piece of music disables all of us. Now, for lots of the young people that we work with, um, it's not just pieces of music like that that disable them. A lot of conventional musical repertoire can be disabling. And so a big part of our work is reimagining musical repertoire, uh, reworking it, reworking a, a slice of society, a social construct, so that it doesn't disable people anymore. Uh, I could go into huge depth about that, but I won't. Um, but one of, the, um, one of the easiest ways to articulate that would be a musical instrument. Now, if I, was, if I was to ask anyone here to play that instrument, <laughs> they wouldn't be able to. Not unless you wanted to make some kind of crazy octopus uh, thing with three people, because it's got three mouthpieces. You can't physically play it. And for lots of the musicians that we work with, conventional musical instruments are very similar to that. They can't physically play them. And so a big part of the work that we do at Open Up Music is to create new musical instruments. Musical instruments that don't disable people. So this is an instrument that we've created called iKeys. Um, it, here it's been played by um, one of our musicians, uh, Bradley Warwick. Um, and he's controlling that musical instrument with his eyes. And that's how he plays the instrument. It's expressive, um, an expressive musical instrument. And he's now a member of one of our orchestras. So let's talk orchestras. So that's clearly the estuary where both of these ideas meet. The idea of uh, musical instruments and musical repertoire. But unfortunately, orchestras are themselves quite disabling things. They are quite closed. We did a bit of research a few years ago. Uh, we ran around all the special schools in the southwest, and we found that not a single one had a school orchestra, which compared to about 50% of secondary schools, which did. Um, the Association, Association of um, British Orchestras did a uh, national report which found 1,240 UK ensembles and they didn't mention a single one that made any provision for young disabled musicians. Now, Open Up Music is all about opening things up. See what we did there? Open up. <laughs> and uh, over the last three years, we've established the UK's first six special school orchestras, which has been a fantastic body of work. Um, and those orchestras have gone on to perform at the Bristol Colston Hall. Um, in some really landmark performances which have been really well attended. They've done a huge amount to raise public expectation and raise aspiration for a lot of these young musicians as well. So this is great. You know, we've got these little pockets of, um, of activity. We're setting up school orchestras and special schools. It's admirable. But I want to talk about world domination. <laughs> pinky in the brain? Does anyone? Yeah? A couple of people, pinky in the brain? Yes. So how do we take this tiny little idea and propagate it? How do we make it expand? How do we, how do we break out of Bristol and the South West and um, bring special school orchestras to the whole of the UK? So um, what we've been doing over the past year is distilling down what we've, what we've developed over the last three years into a holistic package of accessible musical instruments, accessible musical repertoire, um, training and support which we can market to other organisations so that they can set up open school orchestras across the UK. And that way we can propagate the work quickly. Um, that will do two things. Firstly, it will generate income for the organisation, but it will also um, create talent and potential. Because we're also very interested in musical progression. And this September, we just launched the Southwest Open Youth Orchestra, which is the UK's first regional disabled-led youth orchestra. And we've had three rehearsals so far 
it's going to be amazing. So yeah, if you can be around uh, the Colston Hall next July, we're going to be doing a gig. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. And we're not going to stop there. By 2018, we want to have established the world's first national open youth orchestra, a national youth orchestra led by young disabled musicians, not solely for disabled musicians. It's, it's inclusive. So um, it's disabled and non-disabled musicians performing on an equal platform. So clearly the social model of disability has been a huge inspiration to us. It's, it's provided a framework within which we can challenge social conventions that disable people. Um, now, the arts are only one slice of the pie. You know, society is a multifaceted thing. Um, and I think it would be really interesting if everyone went away and considered what the social model of disability might do for their respective slice of the pie. Well, thanks to all the deets. If you want to get in touch, um, it'd be great to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Inclusion is a two-way street, and all too often inclusion is seen as a one-way street. We need to bring disabled people into the non-disabled way of doing things. So what that quite often means for a lot of the young people that we work with is that they, they quite often operate in a quite supportive role. So they might be included in, in a mainstream orchestra, but they tend to be at the back playing an instrument sound that sits nicely under everyone else and it doesn't really kind of uh, conflict too much. And what we're contending is that inclusion is really difficult. You know, it's, 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 it's not an easy fit. And that's actually quite interesting in the arts when things grind against each other. That's, those, are, those are interesting areas. And so by creating, or at least aiming to create, an equal footing whereby um, music can encompass the needs of both disabled and non-disabled musicians, you can come up with some really unique and new musical forms. So yeah, inclusion's not easy. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be easy. If it's easy, you're not probably not doing it properly. <laughs> so do you work with blind schools? Do we work with blind schools? I mean blind musicians. Uh, we do have blind musicians, yeah. We've um, and can I ask how they think the genius. Um and so what was the can you repeat the question? Um do we work with blind schools and how do they read the sheet music? Thank you. <clears throat> sheet music's um is clearly a barrier for lots of young people. Um, I mean, if I find the slide, that is a barrier for me. <laughs> I love some of the uh, things on here. Gradually become agitated. <laughs> like a dirigible. Um, yeah, this is, I, I mean, I googled complex musical score here. How does the cornet use eyes? Ice cream cornet. No, the, um, we're working with um, one incredible young musician who we've just recruited for the Southwest Open Youth Orchestra who is blind. Um, she's autistic. Um, she plays, uh, she's a savant, really. She can, she, you can play her anything and she will be able to play it straight back to you. Um, we found that lots of the young musicians that we work with who are blind just need time to memorise the piece. That's, that's what the social model says. That's the thing that we need to change. Um, they can, we can't expect them to come into rehearsal and just read sheet, mu sheet music. And frankly, many of the young people we work with, sheet music just isn't appropriate anyway. It's just not appropriate, and not just blind people. So, yeah, we do work, we do work with blind people. Um, we need to make all sorts of um, adjustments so that our delivery is, is um, non-disabling. And that includes giving people loads of time to prep their material. Just because the business has been some really interesting developments in there, this is not the easiest business model to have as fully revenue funding. No. And you're in that really interesting stage of actually doing taking on grant funding, being able to do a lot of great work through that. But you're actually now developing products and developing a model which will be partly dependent on earning income. 
Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, how are you doing that, and what are some of the, what's, what's the recent use of that? Okay, so there's, there is a market, um, and um, traditionally what um, accessible musical instrument makers have done is targeted um, schools and disabled people. Um, now that's a fairly small market, um, and consequently these musical instruments are really, really expensive. The most common one retails for about £3,500, and isn't very good. <laughs> um, and consequently, lots of these musicians don't have musical instruments to take home to practice on. Um, what we're doing, we've been, we've been very clear from the start that we don't want to create more barriers for the young musicians that we work with. Um, and a lots of the young musicians that we work with are economically disadvantaged, as well as having various, being disabled in various ways. So um, what we are doing is targeting music hubs. So there's 123 music hubs across, the UK, across England, sorry, all funded by the Arts Council, and they've got a responsibility to provide musical opportunities to all children and young people, and they're patently failing to provide musical opportunities to the young people that we work with. So that's, in, in lots of cases, that's not their fault, because it is a complex area. Um, and quite often, good music practitioners go into these contexts, and they feel just totally at sea, because special educational needs is quite a neat little acronym but actually it belies huge complexity it's incredibly broad you've met one person with special educational needs and disabilities you've met one person with special educational needs and disabilities um, and so what we're hoping to do is to create a holistic package as I said for the open school orchestras which can provide musical repertoire so they're not just going in with nothing and going right we're going to create uh, something they're going in with musical repertoire with the musical instruments that they need we're going to be charging the hubs an annual subscription so that they can provide access to the musical instruments to all of the young people they work with for free. So we're not charging the young people, we're charging the hubs. Um, and as long as they subscribe to it, these young musicians will have a musical instrument to take home to practice on. So that's the model. Um, we've had quite um, some, some good news recently where we've, we've had some investment to launch the Southwest Open Youth Orchestra to develop this uh, next generation of accessible musical instruments. Um, and to continue our open school orchestra program in Bristol and the South West in partnership with the Bristol Music Hub. So it's a super exciting time. Um, but I've lost all my hair. I used to have that wonderful kind of <laughs> mid <laughs> centre parting, but yeah, um, that's all gone know. in the last two months, just gone. <laughs> Thanks so much for giving us a bit of time. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've never done this, okay. so bear with me. <laughs> and this is running by itself. It will do in a moment. Every 20 go. minutes. It's is it now? now? Okay, so let's start with Darkington, where we come from. Country estate in Devon, really old medieval, but as you can see, the top right corner was very influential in social innovation, architectural innovation, lots of experiments. The first modernist building in the UK on the country estate in Devon, next to an old medieval hall and School for Social Entrepreneurs. The guy you saw was Michael Young, who started the school. And from that base, we thought, we need to come to Bristol. We need to do some work in Bristol with School for Social Entrepreneurs. We did have some funding to do some work. And so we brought this to Bristol as a kind of proposal. Let's do some work with School for Social Entrepreneurs in Bristol. We had some help from Kirsten, who was there to help us with kind of 
really, <laughs> yes, it's you, <laughs> to just sort of shape the first ideas and turn it into some kind of proposal, also looking at who could be potential sponsors of this program. And uh, there should be some guy coming up who I thought was going to be here because he said he was, but um, he's not. So Ted Fowler, who used to work for uh, Bristol City Council, great supporter of social enterprise, been around for a long time. I knew Ted from my previous role with uh, social enterprise support. And Ted introduced us to the Urban Enterprise Program, an ERDF-funded program of support for social enterprise in the city. So we kind of put our application in, and it took forever, but eventually we kind of got through and we got funding agreement with uh, ERDF. And if you've ever done the ERDF program, think again, it's, uh, administratively it's quite a nightmare. But that allowed us to start the program here in Bristol. It's a national program funded by Lloyds Bank and Big Lottery, but it needs local match funding, which in Bristol's case was through the Urban Enterprise Program, which meant we were focusing on kind of really people far away from the social enterprise and business startup in Bristol in some of the disadvantaged neighborhoods, some people who are underrepresented. This is our first cohort, started in 2012 and finished in 2013. You may spot some faces on there who are familiar, who are now working, I'm going to see like Paul, I met him this afternoon, he's now working for Voska. And, uh, I'm just picking out a few people from that cohort. So one of the, the, the alumni from that cohort is Rob. Probably lots of you know him with uh, Role for the Soul. Wonderful project. And uh, he was really kind of working on this project while on the course and uh, setting up this new hub and workshop uh, while he was on the program. And we are, we've been using him and his facility for a while. Also Alice Archer, who started the Bristol Fish Project which I kind of went through a bit of a hibernation, but she's actually back in business now, and I've seen that Dermot is here with Grow Bristol, and it looks like maybe there will be some collaboration happening between somebody who was on our first program and Dermot, who's just finished our last program. And that's been great to see. Uh, we're working with Social Enterprise Works on that program, and Social Enterprise Works did a business support program for us, working one-to-one, -one, very much to Elaine, who is not with Social Enterprise Works anymore now, but she was at the beginning, Great friend, great supporter, and Carl, of course, carried on that baton, supporting social enterprise, which allowed us to do much more individual work here in Bristol. And this is one of the projects that uh, the Bristol Support Programme supported, Paper Arts, as they were called then. I think they're now just called Paper. And um, kind of really fantastic project. If you don't know it, go and see them. They're not far, actually, from here, isn't it? You know, sort of towards Broadmead. Um, and this is a photo from the second cohort. So we run three all together. It's the second cohort. This is on the, on the roof of the M shed where we had our graduation ceremony, which was a fantastic event, great views. Uh, cost us a fortune. Probably didn't do it again. But um, it was lovely to be out there. And we've got Ed here today, who's in the audience. Where's Ed? I saw him earlier. And this is one of the projects we supported on that program. And Ed is kind of, as you can see, kind of trying to innovate Braille technology. You know, some people think, oh, that's quite ancient. But actually, if you talk to Ed, there's a good reason for trying to innovate with Braille. And this is Poco Poco Osai, who runs the Youth Empowerment Project here in Bristol. Again, some of you may know him. He's quite active. Again, you know, one of the students on our program. And it kind of shows a little bit the, sort of the spread and the, the breadth of the kind of people we're working with. And of course, these are just little snapshots from the, from the uh, program. So this is Sam and Rosy, who were, uh, Rosy was the learning manager for the program for the first two years. And this, is, uh, this was her last radiation. Sam is basically a woman who runs everything. <laughs> she is uh, the sort of coordinator of the programs and uh, we couldn't do anything without her really. And this is the last program that we've run on the, on the urban enterprise. Project has just finished, and in fact, we had the graduation here in the station um, just a couple of weeks ago. You can see the two cohorts. Actually, the top picture is a picture taken at Dartington when we bring the cohort from Bristol and Plymouth together for a two day residential. This is uh, just a couple of case studies from this last program. This is uh, no, um, Joel Gibbard, who is actually in America at the moment. Really great project with his uh, open bionics. They're turning a 60,000 pound technology into a 3,000 pound affordable technology through using 3D printing. Um, 
on the kind of quite the other side of scale, Sarah Francis with her traveling kitchen, kind of bringing kind of the culture of food into schools, into, into kind of young people's centers, and showing that you don't need to have a big restaurant if you want to be in food. You can find much lower impact um, solutions. This is Conroy. Conroy ran the program. And uh, you know, actually, is not with us now. He just ran the last program on the Urban Enterprise Program. And this is one of, the, one of the sessions we did over at City Farm. And so, I mean, it was part of our the kind of idea that we would use social enterprise spaces here in the city. And that's the last slide, just showing you some of the outputs, which I think are quite incredible. If you think that many of our businesses are really micro businesses, very small businesses. But if you take them together, we had a great impact with these three years of program, you know, off the, off the um, there we go. <laughs> well done on the neighbouring and the education format, but also some of the personal stuff. There's a lot about some of the stuff that we've worked with over the time as well. Some of which are here, which is yeah. great. Apart from testing, we've got a whole 20 seconds of fame. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have any questions for Dirk about the programme. Maybe hey, about Dirk's journey to. Don't be shy. <laughs> You're welcome. There's still a bit left there, I can see. <laughs> so, um, right at the back there, and then David. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day who said that one of the biggest problems they have with social enterprise is the grow it phase. Um, as a thought leading question. But school for social entrepreneurs. It's a really good question, and I think it's a really important subject. So with School for Social Entrepreneurs, at the moment, we run two scale-up programs nationally, unfortunately only in London and Liverpool. But actually, already three projects from Bristol are on these programs, including Paper. They are on the scale-up program now. Seven projects was on it, uh, Hamilton House. So there is a way to get into the scale-up phase with School for Social Entrepreneurs. With here, our school, we do an accelerator program, and Dermot is on the accelerator program here, so you can talk to Dermot as well about how, what that's like. And we're currently developing an idea around transition, this transition to growth. So watch this space. You know, within the SSE network, we're looking at developing an idea for a transitional program, exactly for that space. Thank you. You're such a good cheerleader for what you do, Dirk. It's very Thank you. inspiring. But we heard a little bit from Julia about her journey to what she's doing. Could you say a little bit about yours, where, how you came to My that? journey? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you're very self-effacing, but it's always interesting to know how people get into what they're doing. So it, yeah, in a nutshell, I started out as a potter. I trained as a potter. I came to England to work for a charity, run their ceramics workshop, working with people with disabilities sometimes profound disabilities, and I had no interest at all in social care. For me, it was quite natural. We're working with people of mixed abilities. That was cool. But to just live of donations, handouts, that didn't appeal to me. So I was always interested in how can we generate income, how can we make things more productive, and that was long before you talked about social enterprise. But actually, that was the idea. So how can we all contribute with our abilities and then produce, in a way, products that are sellable and develop distribution networks and production mythologies you know, that can work for people of all abilities. So that's how we got into it. And then I ran my own social enterprise in the Forest of Dean for many years and thought, OK, let's help others do the same. That's my journey. And I miss pottery. <laughs> Do you still do so? I make, I make uh, birthday presents and wedding presents, that kind of thing. So, yes. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, for asking a question about this. Most people talk about the execution. Okay, so um, now we have the time for two minute pitches, and we have five people. Uh, your, your fifth, actually, David's number six. 
Um, and I think the very first person who came back directly to me as soon as the event was publicised was, was Saf. So what, what's we, is we, we do the two-minute pitches, we do time them, um, but what would be great is that if everyone who's doing a two-minute pitch could sort of stand up, be over here, ready to do their two-minute pitch, and then I'll sort of call you in, I'll, I'll ask you a question just to warm you up, and, and then I'll set the timer, and then we'll just go for it. Um, the idea of this section is just to have a really informal way of people sharing um, what they do about business. I'd love to run a Dragon's Den at some point. And actually, Dirk, you run a Dragon's Den, don't you? You run a Dragon's Den, don't you, Dirk, from time to time? A few mock Dragon's Den? Actually, I think I, think I, ran, I, think I ran a mock um, Dragon's Den on your incubator program. Um, okay. Yeah? <laughs> you sure? Do you want to talk two minutes? Is that okay? You don't want to do Okay, um, bear with me one moment, I'll just get this loaded up, and we'll just... We'll it's on the internet, you're on the internet. It's on the internet, yeah, I'm on the internet, I'm on the internet. Okay, so we have a more creative approach to one of our um, two-minute pitches. Because pitches say a thousand words. Um, talk to me. Yes? Yeah. On the site? Okay. Great, okay. John's a... Oh. Okay, yeah, good, like it. Is that where it should be? Yeah. Is it there? Okay, there it is. That's good. Okay, so... So, um, Lucy, we'll, you'll be number six, so then I can, I can do all of that. So, um, if, my, if my phone will work, so Saf, come on up, mate. So, um, everyone welcome Saf from Helpful Peeps. There is absolutely no question about what company you work for. Yeah. Uh, really like that. That's, that's okay, so, if we bear with me on my poor technology. Um, so it, or, in fact, I can just use this. Okay, so I'll count you in. You, you have to go? Yeah. Right. Okay, so three, two, one. Fire away, your two minutes start now. Hi, everyone. I'm Saf, co-founder of Dr. Peeps. I'm here with Simon Hills. Uh, we both left our safe corporate jobs last year to start a social enterprise. Um, Health of Peeps is an online platform that connects people who want help with those who can help for free. You can ask for help with anything. My co-founder managed to get a cat sitter at late notice, and a helpful peep named Tom taught me how to ride a bike. There are 15 million people in the UK that volunteer at least once a month. That's a lot of helpful peeps. Yet the major barrier that prevents us from getting involved is finding opportunities that match our availability. Helpful peeps allows users to help on their own time, as and when they can, with no ongoing time commitment. So we launched in Bristol to validate our idea, and we've grown to about 2,000 users in the last few months. We're, we're currently looking to raise awareness and investment to take things to the next level. Our vision is to grow a global network with millions of people helping each other every day. On a tweet deck or a Twitter wall, or thank you, I already know it's Twitter handle, but anyone else that's okay. so <laughs> if you share your Twitter, if you are on social media, let me know because I'm live sharing it out and pitch, pitching. We are on the live. If you are, if not, don't worry. We're both live streaming and live sharing, this yeah. evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know. Um, yeah, and <laughs> hopefully, this will be a good way of actually engaging a wider audience, how much I find social media yeah. yeah. challenging at times. So, Sarah. Mm. It's a bit confusing, it's actually pronounced Sarah, but Sarah, it's Sarah. Okay. Sarah. Sarah. Um, so your business is the elder tree? My business is the elder tree. So Wonderful. This is and you're happy to chat? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
far away. I'll give you a thirty second one. Thank you. So my business is the elder tree. Um, I'm just setting it up. Uh, the reason is that I'm useless at DIY and crafts. I have a house full of bodge jobs and half-finished jumpers and unsewn-up socks and a garden full of weeds and dead plants. <laughs> so the aim is to work with older people who have skills in crafts, DIY or gardening to help people like me who don't have those skills or want to learn those skills or people who never have a chance to do those skills. So we'll have the older people with the skills and we're also, which I'm very excited about, building a cargo trike with a tool library on the front of it so that you can borrow the tools you need to do craft, gardening, and DIY and have really high quality specialist tools and people to help you. So we'll cycle the tricycle out to community centres, run sessions where people can bring along their projects or learn a new skill and just informally have someone sitting next to them to help them when they're stuck or to advise them on how to start up a project. So, yeah, currently building the bike and looking for tools to be donated or buy them. So if you know anyone who's got their granddad's rake or their grandmother's power tool, do let us know and we'll put it to good use and let you know the use that's been put to afterwards. Amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> Are you also interested in hearing from grandmothers or people who know grandmothers yeah, who have skills? People who know what they're doing very well. That's good. Okay, and do you have a Twitter handle? No, I don't want to do it with Zephyr. No, absolutely. Just, just, just tell us. And we'll... It's at Elder Skills. Elder Skills, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, Neil. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So this is the, the street so, yeah, so business. Yeah. yeah, I'm cheating a little bit. I'm going to be talking to you about someone else's business um, who I found out about, about recently. Um, but it's quite an inspirational uh, story, so I thought I'd share it with everyone. Wonderful. Well, you're um, welcome to create approaches. It, it was so. possibly going to be a bit longer than two minutes, so I'm going to have to cut it a little bit. But uh, we'll yeah. see how we can. Yeah. Yeah. The timing doesn't lie. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so the, the story I'd like to share is um, about an inspirational local. Uh, organic farmer called Luke Hazel. Um, now Luke aims to show the next generation how to make positive changes in our world but starting locally. So he's passionate about helping young and older generations understand where their food is coming from and ultimately he wants us all to meet the farmers and shake hands with the people who are actually providing it to us as well. Now in 2008 Luke donated 22 acres of farmland to establish an organic community farm. And here's a quote from Luke. The community farm is a project that is very close to my heart. If we can involve the community and enable local people to buy fresh organic produce while being directly linked to the place in which it grows, then the future generations may grow up respecting our environmental issues far more than we do now. Now to date, uh, over 409 local people have invested a lot of money in the community, community farm. I think it's, it's over £150,000 now. Um, but what I've also got here for you uh, today is that Luke supplies the meat um, to a lot of local restaurants um, and the Pony and Trap, um, which is a Michelin star restaurant as well. Um, and he's just recently uh, started supplying his meat to local people in Bristol as well. So. If anyone wants to um, order their meat from Luke, um, I have some vouchers to get, get you cheap uh, organic meat, Michelin star quality meat, um, and I can give that out to you tonight if, uh, if you're interested. Um, and that's pretty much it. Links, uh, I was looking for a story group or a story. So the story group, right yeah. Yeah, we, 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 um, so we, uh, we set up a business which has um, in town for me to be available to be a food, um, food partner. So, um, him and Josh. And this is a man who's got how many kids he's got? Four, three. Uh, uh, three, three. Yeah. three. And then you still be getting emails from him at like two o'clock in the morning. He's a partner. <laughs> yeah, really um, thank you. So, next up would be David. So, what business are you talking about, or is it a concept? <coughs> it's. Um, Three pictures in four books in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm based out of Hamilton House and I started Bristol Power Co-op to explore putting solar on people's homes for free and reducing their energy bills. The news from Europe over the last five years is if you invest four times your energy bill, 
in renewables, you will end up with your energy bill being halved. Our energy bill is 400 million pounds a year in Bristol. If we invested 1.6 billion, we will become a 100% renewable city and the energy bills will be halved. Pitch one, that's the news from Europe. My buddies at Hamilton House have built award-winning social housing, including white design architects building straw bale homes in a co-housing community in Leeds. The plan is to build such a community in Bristol. These homes are distant. This is a book called Lilac, Low Impact Living Affordable Community. And it's co-housing. You're living in a community. You're creating jobs. It's cheap. Um, our first project will be in Bristol or Froome, where they have flat pack democracy and 100% independent council. But the thing I really want to talk about is something that's just started in Bristol. Uh, how many of you find it's actually uphill work getting your social enterprise going? Right. Fine. Uh, how many of you... So, I've done organizational development, and I've looked at tools for developing organizations, and this is the best tool I've ever discovered. How many of you have heard of Theory View? Great. We've started the second online MOOC, massive online course, 40,000 people around the world, 20 in Hamilton House, not enough, there'll be another one, and that's the opportunity. I thoroughly advise you to look into leading from the emerging future as a way of helping you work with others and help others. Thank you. Thank you, Danny, for opening up this forum for people. It's really great. I think it's a very wonderful thing that you're doing. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. And all my wonderful streaming and live sharing and doing all the things that I don't do, colleagues. Um, but, David, is that the MIT? Based? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this, is, this is out of MIT. It's the best technology they've ever had for organizational development. And they've given up trying to improve corporations and they're giving this to communities. It's a free move. Oh, and and, and MOOC is basically an online course which Massive makes online easy. course. Wonderful. Okay, and you can look it online. This is the second time we've recommended it. And if you look up in Facebook, Bristol U Labs, there's a group which you can join, and that way you will hear about the next course. It's four people on the current course. If you're really desperate to find out more, then there's four open meetings, and the next one will be on Thursday afternoon in Hamilton House. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, good luck. Um, do you have a Twitter handle, David? No, well, yeah, probably, but I don't know. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you do, it's called B Power Co op. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, is the, uh, is I'm, anyway. If you want to talk to me, I'm in the canteen, right? Yeah, you've got Gotcha. Okay, fantastic. So, seamlessly. Okay. So, shall I just press the button? Let's go to introduce it. I'll do 20 seconds. Okay, fine. Yeah. So my name is Lisa, and uh, I spent first and a half of my adult life as a set designer at Film and Television. And then, following some unfortunate events, I arrived at Bristol with a six week old baby, no family or friends around me, and I couldn't walk. So I had to pull myself up from a very, very long deep pit and basically be very incapacitated. I think I made a stay at home mum's job, which is in itself very rewarding. So I discovered that when I would go out for my small therapeutic physio walks at night, because I would walk so badly, Curves were open, I felt better and feel closed, I felt worse. And what came out of that was an idea called What You're About to See, which I highlighted in February. And thanks to Doug, come on the SSE this year.
uh, that's our two minute pitches. And next time I hope to see what you guys hear, if you haven't stepped up in the past, come up and talk a little bit. But I really appreciate everyone coming up here because it's really not, um, it's, it's really not comfortable. It's not easy and then you have someone telling you've got 30 seconds to go. Um, it just feels, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge to face up on. So I really appreciate it because it's a big hand for everyone. So really, that's, that's it from us. I mean, I, I just wanted to, I'm really pleased personally that we started about 25 minutes late and now we are only five minutes behind schedule. Um, but I really want to wrap up some of, I suppose, what we've talk, started to talk about in terms of the next stage of the Tristan Barber Social Enterprise Network. I'm feeling really pleased and really grateful that some of the colleagues have kind of stepped forward who have been part of the journey all the way along or have stepped forward more recently and we're now sort of forming a structure that we're going to plant the Bar Social Enterprise Network, which will be a good platform for that kind of both our advocacy, but also have the right kind of network, the right kind of people in place, right kind of government, so the right opportunities to come by for the sector, actually those won't pass us by and we'll actually be able to respond to those, as well as just doing what we regularly do, which is convening people and being a really good platform for you to share your work, for you to engage others, or just a reference point if you want to find out what's going on in the sector. If we're doing well and if people are coming to us and talking about their events or whatever we want to share um, with either our sector or beyond that, that you can see that on our website and it's just clear. And it'd be quite interesting to see um, our Twitter feed after this because this is the first time we've probably put out as much content as we have. You know, we just like Social Enterprise UK saying they're following our tweets along from London and they're looking forward to this like a wonderful event and all of the rest of it. So yeah, there you go. Good, good. Yeah. I like what we do here is really inspiring. Everyone does all their businesses. You just hear what people are talking about in their future futures or their two minute pictures. It's amazing and it's a great shame. It feels like a missed opportunity to me constantly. We're not just shouting about that in a really simple way and sharing that with people. Because like I say, everyone's busy. We work in a lean sector, so everyone's busy, just heads down, getting on with their business. And the more we can actually connect with each other, or just know that other people are doing good things, the better place we are to really move this forward. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Enjoy the wine.